Wonders of Saint Joseph Part 11 The reason for Saint Joseph preeminence what is the justification of this doctor which has been more and more accepted in the course of 5 centuries the principle invoked more or less explicitly by Saint Bernard Saint Bernardino of Siena Isidore de Azolanes Francisco Suarez and more recent authors is the one and simple sublime formulated by Saint Thomas when treating the fullness of grace in Jesus and, and Holiness in Mary exceptional divine mission calls for a corresponding degree of grace this principle explained by the holy soul of jesus being united personally to the word the source of all grace received the absolute fullness of grace it explains also why mary called to be the mother of god received from the instant of her conception an initial fullness of grace which was greater than the initial fullness of all the saints together since she was nearer than any other to the source of grace she drew grace more abundantly it explains also why the apostles were nearer to to our blessed lord and the saints who followed them had more perfect knowledge of the mysteries of faith to preach the gospel infallibly to the world they received at pentecost the gift of a most eminent most enlightened and most firm faith as a principle of their apostolate this same truth explains why saint joseph's preeminence to understand we must add one more remark all works which are to be referred immediately to god himself are perfect the word of creation For example which proceeded in Italian directly from the hand of God was perfect the same must be said of his great servants whom he has chosen exceptionally and immediately not through a human instrument to restore the order disturbed by sin God does not choose as men do men often choose incompetent officials for the higher posts but those whom God to himself chooses directly immediately to be his exceptional minister work of redemption receive from him grace proportional to the vocation this was the case with saint joseph he must have received a relative fullness of grace proportionate to his vocation in life this was the case with saint joseph he must have received a fullness of grace since he was chosen not by men but by god himself and by god alone to fulfill a mission unique in the world we cannot say at what precise moment saint joseph sanctification took place but we can say from the moment of his marriage to our lady he was already confirmed in grace because of his special mission To what order does Saint Joseph's exceptional mission belong? Saint Joseph's mission is evidently higher than the order of nature, even angelic order, but it is simply of the order of grace, as was that of Saint John the Baptist who prepared the way of salvation that the apostles had in the church for the sanctification of souls, and that more particular mission of the founders of religious orders. If we examine the question carefully, we must see that Saint Joseph's mission surpasses the order of grace. It borders by its term on the hypostatic order, which is constituted by the mystery of the incarnation. but it is necessary to avoid exaggeration and understatement in the matter mary's unique mission a divine motherhood has its own uh, term in the hypostatic orders so also in a sense saint joseph's hidden mission this is the teaching of many saints and other writers saint bernard says of saint joseph he is the faithful and the prudent servant whom the lord made the support of his wa- mother the foster father of his flesh and the sole most faithful cooperator on earth in his great design Saint Bernardine of Siena writes when God chooses a person by grace for a very elevated mission he gives all the grace required for it this is verified in a specially outstanding man case of Saint Joseph foster father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the spouse of Mary Isidore de Isolanes places Saint Joseph's vocation above that of apostles he remarks that the vocation of apostles to preach gospel and enlighten soul reconcile them with God and that the vocation of Saint Joseph is more immediately in relation to Christ himself since he is the spouse of the mother of God the foster father and the protector of the savior suarez teaches to the same effect certain offices pertain to the order of sanctifying grace and among that of apostles who the highest place does they have need of more gratuitous gifts than the other souls especially gratuitous gifts of wisdom but uh, there are other offices which touch upon a border on the order of hypostatic union as can be seen clearly in the case of the divine maternity of the blessed virgin and it is to that order that the ministry of saint joseph pertains Some years ago there was Monsignor Sinibaldi titular bishop of the Tiberias and the secretary of the Sacred Congregation of Studies re- treated the question very ably he pointed out that ministry of saint joseph belonged in a sense because of its term to the hypostatic order not that of saint joseph cooperated intrinsically as physical instrument to the whole holy spirit realization mystery of incarnation for under the respect his role is very much inferior to that of mary but that he was predestined to be in the order of moral causes the protector of the virginity and the honor of mary at the same time as a foster father protector of the word made flesh his mission pertains by its term to the hypostatic order not through intrinsic physical and immediate cooperation but through extrinsic moral and mediate through mary cooperation which is however really and truly a cooperation
Saint Joseph's predestination is one with the degree of the incarnation. Saint Joseph's preeminence becomes all the clear if we consider that the eternal degree of the incarnation covered not merely the incarnation abstraction from circumstances of time and place, but the incarnation here and now. That is to say, incarnation Son of God, who by the operation of the Holy Spirit was to be conceived at a certain moment of time by the Virgin Mary, spouse to a man of the family of David, whose name was Joseph. The angel Gabriel was sent by God into a city of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin and spouse to a man whose name was Joseph, the house of David. All the indications are therefore that Saint Joseph was predestined to be the foster for the incarnate Word before being predestined to glory. The ultimate reason being that uh, Christ's predestination as man to the natural divine sonship precedes the predestination of all the elects, and Christ is the first of the predestined. The predestination of Christ to the natural divine sonship is simply the degree of the incarnation, which, as we have seen, includes Mary's predestination of divine motherhood and Joseph to be the foster father and the protector of the incarnate Son of God. As the predestination of Christ to the natural divine sonship is superior to this predestination to glory and precedes it, and as the predestination of Mary to the divine mother precedes a predestination to glory, so also the predestination of Saint Joseph to be the foster father and incarnate but precedes his predestination to glory and to grace. In other words, the reason why he was predestined to be the highest degree of glory after Mary and in consequence the highest degree of grace and of charity is that he was called to be worthy foster father and protector of the man-god. The fact that St. Joseph's first predestination was one with the degree of the incarnation shows how elevated his unique mission was. This is what people mean when they say that St. Joseph was made and put in the world to be the foster father of the incarnate word and that God willed for him a high degree of glory and grace to fit him for his task. The Special Character of the St. Joseph's Mission Among the different vocations, there are two in the scriptures that seem to be directly opposed to each other. The first is that of the Apostle, second of St. Joseph. Jesus was revealed to the Apostle that they might announce him throughout the world. He was revealed to St. Joseph, who was to remain silent and kept him hidden. The Apostles are light to make the world see Jesus, whereas Joseph is like a veil to cover him. And under that mysterious veils are hidden from us the virginity of Mary, the greatness of the Saviour of the soul. He who makes the apostles glorious with the glory of preaching glorifies Joseph by the humility of silence. The hour for the manifestation of the mystery of the incarnation had not yet struck and it was to be preceded by the 30 years of the hidden life. Perfection consists in doing God's will, each one according to his vocation. St. Joseph's vocation of silence and obscurity surpassed that of the apostles because it bordered more nearly on the redemptive incarnation. After Mary, Joseph was nearest to the author of grace. And in the silence of Bethlehem, during exile in Egypt, and in the little home of Nazareth, he received more grace than any other saint. His mission was a dual one. As regards Mary, he persevered and preserved her virginity by contracting with her a through an altogether holy marriage. The angel of the Lord said to him, Joseph, son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Spirit. Mary is truly his wife. The marriage was a true one, as St. Thomas explained when showing its appropriateness. There should be no room for doubt, however light, regarding the honor of the son and of the mother. If ever doubt did arise, Joseph, the most informed and the least suspect witness, would be there to defend it. Besides, Mary would find help and protection in St. Joseph. He loved her with a pure, devoted love in God and for God, and their union was stainless and most respectful on the side of St. Joseph. Thus, he was nearer than any other saint to the mother of God and the spiritual mother of men, and he too was a man. The beauty of the whole universe was nothing compared with that of the union of Mary and Joseph, a union created by the Most High, which ravished the angels and gave joy to the Lord. As regards the incarnate word, Joseph watched over him, protected him, and contributed to his human education. He is called his foster father, by the term does not express fully the mysterious, supernatural relationship between the two. A man becomes foster father of a child normally as a result of an accident, but it was no accident in the case of St. Joseph. He had been created and put in the world for that purpose. It was the primary reason of his predestination and the reason for all the graces he received. Bossuet expresses this well. If nature does not give a father's heart, where will it be found? In other words, St. Joseph was not... A Jesus' father, how could he have a father's heart in his Jesus' regard? Here we must recognize the action of God. It is by the power of God that Joseph has a father's heart, and if nature fails, God gives one with his own hand. For it is of God that it is written that he directs our inclination where he wills. He gives some a heart of flesh when he softens their nature by charity. Does he not give all the faith for the hearts of children? 
when he sends the, to them the spirit of his son the apostles fear the least danger but god gave them a new heart and their courage became undaunted the same hand gave joseph the heart of a father and jesus the heart of a son that is why jesus obeys and joseph does not fear to command how has he the courage to command his creator because the true father of jesus christ the god who gives him birth from all eternity having chosen joseph to be the father of his only son in time sent down into his bosom some ray or some spark of his own infinite love for his son that is what changed his heart that is what gave him a father's love and joseph the just man who feels the father's heart within him feels also that god wishes him to use his paternal authority so that he dares to command him who he knows is his master this is equivalent to saying that joseph was predestined first to take the place of a father in regard to the savior who could have no earthly father and in consequence to have all the gifts which were given him that he might be a worthy protector of the incarnate word it is necessary to say that with what fidelity saint joseph guarded the triple deposit confided to him the virginity of mary the person of jesus christ the secret of the eternal father that of the incarnation of his son a secret to be guarded faithfully till the hour appointed for its revelation in a discourse that was given by pope pius the 11th and saint peter mission and saint john the baptist mission between the two mission there appears that of saint joseph one of recollection and silence one almost unnoticed and destined to be lit up only many centuries afterwards a silence which would become a resounding hymn of glory but only after many years but where the mystery is deepest it is there precisely that the mission is the highest and there a more brilliant cottage of uh, virtues is required with their corresponding echo of merit it was unique and sublime mission that of guarding the son of god the king of the world that of protecting the virginity of mary that of entering to participation in the mystery hidden from the eyes of ages and so to cooperate in the incarnation and the redemption This is equivalently to state that the divine providence conferred on Saint Joseph all the grace he received of his special mission. In other words, Saint Joseph was predestined first of all to be as a father to the Savior, and was then predestined to the glory and the grace which were becoming in one favored with so exceptional a vocation. Ite ad Joseph, which means let us go to Joseph. If you wish to be close to Christ, we again have to say this. What is the closest possible union you can have with Jesus in this life? It is your reception of Jesus in the communion. No greater intimacy with Jesus possible in this life or than at the Eucharist because Jesus is present body, blood, soul and divinity. But Saint Joseph lived in the actual presence of Jesus. He was not able to receive him the bread of life. Saint Joseph was given the role of maintaining and protecting the sacred bread for you. You are probably familiar with the story of the book of Genesis about the sons of Israel selling one of their brothers into slavery and this brother Joseph ended up being the owner of uh, Egypt far away from all the others and what the men did to their brother was so horrible and shameful but God had a plan Pharaoh the king of Egypt adopted Joseph into his own family so Joseph was regarded as a son of Pharaoh and he was given authority Pharaoh placed him in charge of all the granaries in Egypt and at that time Egypt was considered the breadbasket of the world and Joseph did an incredible job of storing up the grain during the years of famine and it, the grain that was stored was like the sand of the sea it was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure though Joseph brother sold him into slavery god had wonderful plans for him after joseph had stored up such a grain a severe famine had broke out in egypt and the surrounding areas as a result there was shortage of food and pharaoh instructed everyone in egypt to go to egypt and do whatever he tells you The famine became so extreme that even Joseph's brothers, the one who had sold him into slavery, journeyed to Egypt in search of food. When the brothers met the man in charge of the granaries in Egypt, so much time had elapsed that they did not even recognize they were standing in the presence of their own brother, whom they had sold into slavery. But Joseph, because of his Egyptian royalty, was dressed differently and was called a lord. To make a long story short, Joseph hid his identity, but was filled with kindness and mercy towards his brothers. He provided them grain, filled their sacks, so that they could get plenty to their father Israel. Eventually, he revealed his identity, extended his forgiveness, gave thanks to God for what He had done for his life and how He had saved him. And now He had given him opportunity to save them from famine and death. This story of the Old Testament is a prefiguration of a greater Joseph who would bring the sun, the bread of uh, heaven, to safety in Egypt. Saint Joseph safeguarded a food capable of saving the entire world. Saint Joseph our spiritual father is much greater than the Joseph of Old Testament because he was a keeper of the bread of heaven. His desire in heaven is that for all children should consume the bread of everlasting life. Saint Laurent 
Parenthesis says the former Joseph of Old Testament was holy, righteous, pious, chaste, but this Joseph of the New Testament surpasses him in holiness and perfection as the sun outshines the moon. God sent this Saint Joseph into Egypt so that out of Egypt Saint Joseph could bring the bread of life to the nations. Saint Joseph saved the bread from Herod. He protected and preserved him in Egypt, and he now desires that we receive the bread of heaven at Holy Mass. Unlike Joseph of the Old Testament, Saint Joseph's heavenly bread is more numerous than sands of the sea. This heavenly bread is able to feed all multitudes, satisfy every soul. Pharaoh, the mighty king of Egypt, exalted Joseph and made him the highest prince in his kingdom because he stored up the grain and bread and saved the people of his entire kingdom. So Joseph saved and protected Christ, who is the living bread and gives eternal life to the world. He, Saint Joseph, most diligently reared him, whom the faithful were to receive as the bread that came down from heaven, whereby they might obtain eternal life. Without Joseph, we would not have the living bread of Eucharist. Mary kneaded the dough in her sacred womb. Saint Joseph lovingly preserved the bread in Egypt. He continues to guard and preserve the bread of heaven in every tabernacle in the world. Saint Joseph made it possible for all the children to receive this bread of everlasting life. Joseph is still charged with guarding the living bread. Today, there is a worldwide spiritual and moral famine in the earth. Souls are dying because of lack of spiritual nourishment. Hearts are broken, marriages ruined, lives are destroyed, children murdered in the womb. Truth and common sense are short supply. The spiritual and moral famine in the world is devastating every nation and laying waste to humanity. There is not a single country left that is not affected by it. What are we to do? To whom are we to go to find this nourishment for our soul? Go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you. Ite Al Yosef. Yes, if you want to form an idea of St. Joseph's greatness, says St. Bernard of Clairvaux, consider that by divine privilege he is merited to bear the title Father of Jesus. Reflect too that his own name Joseph means to increase. Keeping in mind the great patriarch Joseph who was sold by his brothers in Egypt, understand that our saint has inherited not only the name, but even more his power, his innocence and his sanctity. As a patriarch, Joseph stored the wheat not for himself but for the people in their time of need. So Joseph was received a heavenly commission to watch over the living bread, not for himself alone, but for the entire world. St. Joseph in the Roman canon. It was only in the last century that Pope John XXIII, who had a great devotion to St. Joseph, inserted his name into the Roman canon of the Mass, which is the perpetual memorial of redemption after the name of Mary and before the apostles, popes and martyrs. St. Joseph's name was inserted so late. Is St. Joseph a weapon? Yes, St. Joseph is an extremely powerful weapon for Christianity, but what St. Pope uh, Paul II is referring to is the Roman ca- canon of the Mass, of the Eucharistic prayers that the priests say at Mass. For centuries, there was only one Eucharistic prayer, and after the Second Vatican Council, the Church started to use four Eucharistic prayers, with Eucharistic Prayer 1 retaining the name of the Roman canon. It was into this Roman canon Eucharistic Prayer 1 that Pope St. John XXIII inserted the name of St. Joseph. It is hard to believe that St. Joseph's name is not appearing in the prayers for so long. He is a mirror of patience. And it is truly inspiring that in 1958, a bishop with great devotion to St. Joseph elected to the papacy, that is Angelo Roncalli. He loved St. Joseph so much and he contemplated taking the papal name of Joseph. Out of respect for his earthly father, however, he decided to take the name John. Since there had already been many previous popes, uh, he was John the Twenty-Third. He opened the Second Vatican Council, entrusting the entire endeavor to St. Joseph. And finally, in one of the sessions, he, uh, a bishop named Peter Coulet offered a presentation on St. Joseph to the other bishop. In the lengthy presentation, this bishop Coulet requested that the name of Joseph be included in the canon of the Mass. Unfortunately, Bishop Coulet was not well known, and due to his long and repetitious uh, presentation as well as his nervousness, inability to articulate things, many of the cardinals and bishops at the presentation began to murmur and ridiculed him for his pious and lengthy speech. At one point, the moderator of the session requested this Bishop Cule end his eloquent and holy sermon about St. Joseph, and the moderator's belittling words caused many of the cardinals and the bishop to laugh, resulting in Bishop Cule shuffling his aged body back to his seat, feeling defeated. Listening in on the speech by a closed-circuit television, Pope John XXIII was not amused by the treatment given to Bishop Cule. Pope John XXIII knew this bishop personally. He knew that his bishop had suffered under the communists in Yugoslavia. And this bishop was frequently interrogated by the communists in cruel ways and even sentenced to 11 years of hard labor in concentration camp in Yugoslavia. They even attempted to kill him by placing him on a train that was deliberately wrecked in order to kill everyone on board. As a result of the wreck, the bishop's hips were shattered. 
After he was finally released from the concentration camp, the Bishra suffered bouts of anxiety and nervousness, making it hard for him to speak without repeating himself and stammering. John the Twenty Third knew what the bishop's presence at the council had taken much effort, and that this good bishop wanted to be there to testify that he had been spared from death only through the intercession of Saint Joseph. This bishop Cullis' speech on Saint Joseph nearly brought Pope John the Twenty Third to tears and caused this pope to react and act. On November thirteenth, three days after Bishop Cullis gave his presentation on Saint Joseph, Pope John the Twenty Third decreed that the name of Saint Joseph would be included in the Roman Canon of the Mass. The decree went into effect on 8th of December 1962 and today the St Joseph name appears in all the four Eucharistic prayers because of the pontificates of Benedict the 16 and Pope Francis who intended to insert the St Joseph's name into the other three Eucharistic prayers but was not able to accomplish it before his abdication of the papacy on 28th of February 2013 Pope Francis fulfilled the intentions of Pope Benedict the 16 and officially placed The name of Saint Joseph in all the Eucharistic prayers on 1st May 2013. The first Eucharistic prayer reads in communion with those whose memory we venerate especially the glorious ever virgin Mary mother of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ and blessed Joseph her spouse. Second Eucharistic prayer have mercy on us all we pray that with the blessed virgin Mary mother of God with blessed Joseph her spouse The third Eucharistic prayer reads May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect especially with the most blessed virgin Mary mother of God with blessed Joseph her spouse Fourth Eucharistic prayer reads to all of us your children grant O merciful father that we may enter into a heavenly inheritance with the blessed virgin Mary mother of God and with blessed Joseph her spouse Finally Saint Jose Maria says that when Pope John the 23rd closed the first session of the Vatican Council announced that the name of Saint Joseph was going to be included in the canon of the mass a very important judgment telephoned me to say congratulation listening to the pope's announcement i thought immediately of you now happy you'd be and indeed i was happy for in that councilier gathering which represented the whole church brought together in the holy spirit there was proclaimed the great supernatural value of saint joseph's life